Um, there'll be a few passages of scripture that we'll be going to as well tonight. And um, I just want to share those things. Often over over the last few weeks of um, of December, it's um, it's been something that for many years the Lord has has spoken some things, and I think there's a reason why He speaks those things to us. He speaks those things because um, we as humans need encouragement for days to come. Uh, we need to know that we're not taken, uh, things are not just taken for granted, that this is just the way it works, and this is the way God does things. It's like, no, He actually speaks to us first, and and so He prepares us. He's a really good God in that regard, and I, I, I'm grateful for Him for that. And so, um, I wanted to share a few things that, that he was speaking to me that are, um, I think, important. Some of the things. At this juncture of history, um, honestly, there are the best things and some of the worst things that are happening at the same time with the church. There are things that, that are happening where, where he is um, he's making it known that the days ahead are days that matter. They're days that are very important to, to, his, to his purposes. Let me turn this off. Um, and that this nothing is unplanned with him. We are at the perfect time in history. We've actually been brought to uh, a place in history where um, I believe that the apostles long for. One of the things you have to recognize and realize is that the apostles lived in an era where government was completely, it, it was a muck, it was a mess. It was absolutely the, the most horrible time for Christians. It was um, a time of great difficulty for Christians, many persecuted. Um, my daughter was just, she, she saw something today, and I guess it was since 2000. 15 in Nigeria, we don't hear about this, but uh, I think the number that she said was 50,000 Christians have been killed since yeah. 2015. Uh, we don't hear about that. We don't hear about the, the things that happened in India and Pakistan. Uh, um, we don't hear about some of the horrific events that are happening around the world that are very narrow like and we in America have been, ah, we, we've been kept um, protected, so protected from, from this whole issue of persecution. Uh, you know, we get upset when a non-Christian yells at us, and um, uh, that's not persecution. Uh, or, you know, or we, we think it's persecution because people are taking Christ out of Christmas. Well, if they don't know Jesus, why would they put Christ in? Sinners sin. And sometimes we, are, we expect sinners to function as Christians. And, um, you have to catch fish before you can clean them. And if you haven't caught them, they're not going to be cleaned. And so there's a lot of stuff that we fight that are useless battles. The apostles never fought them. 
Jesus never addressed the issues of government. The one issue of government he did focus on is he said, uh, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what's God's. Mm -hmm. And and the, the statement was basically saying, what I've said to you for months now, the kingdom of heaven, it will not be driven by Babylonian systems of money, which is what we operate in whether it's the new or whether it's the Brexit that's now begun, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter. They're both Babylonian systems. The, the kingdom of God doesn't function that way, never has functioned that way, and will not be functioning that way in the future. And if you aren't used to the fact that you have to learn to trust God and that God will be your source and your provision, you will make every error in the world trying to figure out how you can save money when it may not matter how much money you save. Amen. In Zimbabwe, uh, a few years ago, uh, and more than a few years ago now, but this one guy, Mugabe, took over, and uh, he pretty quickly turned the economy uh, where you needed a suitcase to go grocery so shopping. That's how little the value of their quote-unquote dollar was. It was useless. Um, there are places that I grew up, where I grew up in South Africa, when I was growing up, the value of their rand, which is the equivalent of like a dollar, back then, one rand would buy eight dollars today, I'm sorry, one, um, one dollar would buy um, eight rand. Today, it takes anywhere between 18 and 20 rand to buy one dollar. The economy's crashed. And we look at those things and we're like, oh God, don't let that happen here. And so we're trying to figure out how we can stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the, the secret, and I revealed this part six months ago, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else yeah. will be added to you. Yeah. You'll say, well, shouldn't we store? Shouldn't we save? Well, you can but I'm telling you that those who seek first the kingdom of God, it's not going to be based upon what they've stored or say. It's going to be based upon the fact that they seek first the kingdom of God and everything else we have to. Amen. And that we don't know what that even looks like. We don't know how to do that. So many haven't learned that. And so as a result, there's this constant struggle against a political, monetary, mammon-built system to try and make it work for us. And I just want you to know that there's a lot of things that aren't going to work in the days to come. Mm -hmm. And so there's the worst of stuff and the best of stuff in the world. There are things where there's all kinds of breakthrough scientific stuff that some of it's really creepy. Mm -hmm. Some of it literally is, is hedging on um, very evil wickedness, but people don't realize that uh, this has been going on for centuries. That Hitler was trying to marry, you ready for this? Weapons to demons. Back that far. In a supernatural, he knew there was something demonic and supernatural that he, he wanted to get in touch with. Well, people are doing that today. They're work, trying to work on how can we make something that is demonic as a weapon. Wow. And we look at that and we go, no way. Yeah, way. Those things are happening. They're real. And if your concern is that you have to have everything in peace in the world, well, your next best hope is called the Antichrist. Did you hear me? If you're looking for peace in the world, you're looking for the Antichrist. That's who you're looking for. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus. And Jesus comes into people. And Jesus changes people. And just like unsaved people will kill their babies, a person with Jesus in them won't. 
The issue has never been trying to moderate how we can legislate some kind of righteousness. Listen, everyone is born with a knowing of what is good and evil. If they choose evil long enough, they will become calloused to that fact. And Romans is clear. They will become uh, anathema. They will, they will turn their back on God. They will not be, they will be irrecoverable. Why? Because they're, they've given everything over. But that's the world we're living in right now. In the church, wow. Some of you know some things that have happened just recently. I don't mind mentioning because it's everywhere on the news. It doesn't really matter. But what has happened at IHOP in Kansas City? And uh, some others of you know what's happened with T.D. Jakes. And um, there are exposures that are coming at the highest places. Listen to me. The highest places. And right now we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Why? Because God will have a pure church. And you might say, well, man, you use their names. The Apostle Paul used people's names. There are times where you say, do you see that? Yeah, that's not God. Now you can ask all the questions you want, but here to me is one of the biggest issues, and I haven't even got to, to what I want to share with you yet, but I want to say this. There is this little verse in Exodus where God speaks to Moses and he makes an emphatic statement, ten statements. We know of as the Ten Commandments. And most of us go, well, we're not under law. Yeah, let me explain something. You may not be under law, but I can promise you that all those laws are under his grace. They keep us walking together. They keep us they keep us civil. Okay? And the first one, the first one is you will have no gods before me. That's the first. And the reality is is that what we have developed in Christendom have been um, idols. We have put people on pedestals so high that when they fall we fall with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was, there was somebody that posted something that I read, and I was thinking about it. They were so angry. I thought, well, should they really be angry at the person who fell? We get angry at the people who fall, but, and, and, and I understand that because they're hiding, because they're faking it, because there is deception at every juncture there but in their being deceptive they are also um, there are many times that young people particularly young and those whose weak is very weak their faith is very weak they fall away and so when they fall away we get mad Um, in Mo we've been through a few situations uh, through the years and um, where people have, um, some of them have been very close to me. And, um, and as a result, and they failed. They fell. There were things they did that were wrong, really wrong. And, um, and it was very deceptive. And you want, you want to become angry. I know that for some people, depending on what the issue was, people got angry, you know. Uh, because some of it had to do with supernatural signs and somebody was faking it. And um, it took a while to get them caught. And so when they were caught, you kind of go, so is all this stuff bogus? Does any of it make sense? Is any of it real? And, uh, and when somebody falls into immorality, you go, they knew Jesus. They were, I was following them. I was following their teaching. I was, what? What? And so we, we, we become angry, but here's what I want to tell you. The real issue is not that we should be angry with them. But we should learn to choose 
who our God is. And our God are not these heroes. Our God are not these people who have given their lives to the gospel and they may have fallen, they may have failed. We have taught, literally, we have taught the new school of ministry schools. You need to hear this. We teach them literally things. We talk about Branham. We talk about, um, uh, I, I can go through a whole bunch of them. Yeah. You can go through Jack Coe, you can go through whatever. You, and you, you can go through all these different people who move in incredible signs and wonders but at the end of their life, at the end of their life, Branham believed he was the Elijah of God. And he would tell people, he would give them words of knowledge, and then he would say, do you believe that I'm the Elijah of God? And they'd say yes. And as a result of that, they would be healed. When he died, his people kept his body for I can't remember how many months, believing he would be raised from the dead. And they... They had this sense of worship towards who he was. And we've used that. We've, we've kind of cleaned up their pasts. But we use them as models for the future. We all saw a movie this last year. It was very much part of my, my background. Uh, it was called uh, The Jesus Revolution. How many of you saw The Jesus Revolution? Many of you. Um, but the guy who was in that movie, Lonnie, had serious moral issues. Did he reach people? Yes. But what are we putting up as a model for people to follow? Are we putting up models that when they fall, we judge them, but the fact is, is that we haven't given them any better models? And we haven't taught them Jesus should be your model. You are called to be disciples after Jesus. Something amazing happened after Jesus came on the earth. John the Baptist had disciples. When Jesus came on the earth, all of a sudden, None of the other apostles had disciples. Mm. Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. John pointed to Jesus. That was it. But we have this sense, I need to be taught like this. I need to be trained here. I need to learn from this person. I need to go from here. And so as a result, we have people that are running to and fro everywhere, and they put hope in wrong things. And so when somebody collapses, they collapse with it. Why? Because that was your hope. Your hope was you would become like them, that you'd be able to minister like them, that you would carry an anointing like them, that you might receive their mantle like them. Mm. So the title of tonight, really quickly, and I'm going to go through this as quick as I can, because I don't, I don't want to waste time, and I want us to worship, and I want us to fellowship, and I want us to pray for each other. And I think we're going to do communion tonight. And uh, we're going to ask God to break things tonight. And break things tonight that we can leave in 2023. And, and, and break into 2024 with great joy and peace in the presence of Jesus. The title I have is The Sky is About to Open on the Kingdom. I did not say the church. On the kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me explain for those of you who don't understand the difference. For years, people have been talking about, I'm a kingdom person, I'm a kingdom person. Really not understanding. They mean by that, oh, we'll work with anybody because we're kingdom people, we don't mind. We're good. The kingdom is actually not a noun, it's a verb. Yes. That when Jesus came to bring the kingdom, he said, the kingdom is in you, it's on you, it's about you. It's over you. What was it? It was the activity of the king. So when you think of kingdom, do not ever think of kingdom without the little phrase or the little word activity. So 
when you see kingdom activity, the kingdom's present. When there's no kingdom activity, the kingdom's not there. You might be saved. You might be sitting there in with, with other believers, but it doesn't mean there's kingdom. It doesn't mean there's kingdom even tonight in our gathering. It says he will be in the midst. But until he begins ruling in our midst, there's no kingdom. Did you hear me? Where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. But until I rule in your midst, I'm not, there's no kingdom. And he taught us to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Why? Because the kingdom carries the activity. You, you, you can't get proud about the kingdom. Because it's activity. And you know you can't save anybody. You can't heal anybody. You can't miracle anybody. You can't have faith that, that something's going to happen and it's you. you. It's not you. Activity of the kingdom is not you. It's him through you. It brings everybody onto the same playing field. It doesn't matter if you've been taught great and that you're, you've gone through every theological school there is or if you're a brand new baby believer. The kingdom can function as powerfully through either one. Because it is the kingdom that he taught us to preach. Why? This gospel of the kingdom. Some people know, yeah. you know, they teach the gospel um, that is the, the saving gospel. I understand that. That's an important aspect of the kingdom. But he sent his disciples out to preach about the kingdom. What he was saying was he's saying, tell them I'm about to come there. I'm about to do something. Even in the language he used, he says, tell them I'm coming. And he tells his disciples, I'm coming to everywhere you're going. There was, there was a nuance in what he was saying. He's saying, do you get this? You're going to go, and you're going in my name, but I'm going to show up there with you. It's amazing. It's kingdom. And so the sky is about to open on the kingdom. So become completely consumed with the kingdom. And I mean everywhere. There are areas in my life I have to repent from because I realize that I have kingdom in this area, but I don't, I don't have it in every area. And I don't have it I, in, in areas where I, he's not ruling, he's not reigning. I believe one of the biggest things that God is going to begin doing with us this evening is beginning to remind us of the things that we want to leave in 23 that are not kingdom. They have nothing to do with the kingdom. And we think they've been so important, but they're not important. They're just not important. And then he said, and the covers are coming off. That's the second part. The sky's about to open over the kingdom, and the covers are about to come off. I want you to picture yourself, every person here. And, and I'm saying this because I want you to understand the um, the fear, the trepidation that would happen if somebody were to come in your room and rip the covers off and you were wearing nothing. I want you to understand the, the, the sense of, oh my gosh, the violation of what's there. Let me just explain something. God has always done this. He speaks in Ezekiel. If you read Ezekiel, you'll find out that Ezekiel is really probably a, uh, um, an NC-17 movie. It is vile. There are things in Ezekiel where he talks, literally talks about body parts. And they're, it's vile. But he's explaining the hearts of people that are just direct their mess. And we, particularly here in the West, we have this, oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to know about it. And most of the time, we don't grow because we don't want to see and notice this is something that creates shame. In fact, in Isaiah, it says, I brought you to this place, but you will not be ashamed of it. Yeah. And the reality is, is that we need to understand is that the shame that has come is not a shame on them. It is a shame on the body of Christ. Who? Oh. Which changes our whole disposition. We go, oh God, 
Purify your bride. That's where those songs come from. Purify my heart. That's where it comes from. Where the songs that you go, oh God, please, wake us up before we mess up. I, I've said to the Lord many times, Lord, if I would ever go in that area and, 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 and fail you, take me home early. I'm good. I don't want to bring any shame to your name or to your body. I'd rather you take me home, please. Because it, it's such a strong thing against people and uh, against the church. Okay, here we go. I think you'll understand this statement. Headship is being taken over by Jesus, the head of the church. Amen. As soon as you start noticing somebody is who the head, this, they're the head of this ministry. I'm learning to duck. I am. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect. Listen to this part, ready? To be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. The word there is, anybody know? I've shared it with you before. Pleroma. It is the fullness of time. It is the fullness of everything that God wants to release. Where God wants to release the fullness of things. That, and and the, the reason we're saved, the reason we're carrying what we're carrying, it, it, it's, it's so he can display his wonders through us. So God can take sinners and crazy things happen through them. It's the reason angels long to look into what we've got. But he goes on and he says, um, to be put into effect when the times. I'm just going to tell you. Ready? It's when. Okay? It's when. The times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for praise of his glory. The whole chapter is amazing. In Colossians, we read again, verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So I just I wanted to touch on that, that, that we're going to begin seeing the role of Jesus coming up in a lot more places. I've been in relationship with a number of places and, and everything they're saying is they're saying, oh, we are not leading this right. It's good. You're saying, oh, we can't lead that way. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it's it puts somebody at the top. Mm-hmm. There's a pastor at the top, we can switch where we put it, we could say, well, that's a senior pastor, a pastor of a big movement or whatever, or you could say it's the Pope. It's the person who's at the top. And the, the reality is, is that what God intended for the church was always where he released apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to function 
together to hear what the Lord wanted to say. Not what the pastor wanted to say. Not what the apostle wanted to say. But what the Lord wanted to say. And we're going to begin seeing that emerging in a lot of places who absolutely want his presence. But I will tell you that some will struggle because they're going to, I don't know if anybody heard the word I gave at Breakthrough, but the word had to do with the fact that there are people who want fame. They want name. And that's not going to happen. That what God is going to do is release something that honors him where people go and they go, yeah, I, I, I'm not exactly even sure who led that thing. Mm-hmm. Jesus was there. Yeah. Jesus was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that there's only one Lord. Not many Lords. I believe that we are under shepherds. That we take care of the flock for the shepherd. For the shepherd. That we take care of the flock for the head of the church. And by that, I don't mean manipulating them. I mean protecting them. You know, that was the primary job of a shepherd. Protecting them and feeding them. Think of yourself like a, a very poor shepherd. And you'll be okay. Just got to feed people. And you got to protect them. Um, wow. I'm getting through this faster than I thought. That's good. I spoke about uh, deep calling to deep briefly last week. I think it was was it just Tuesday? I shared that. And what it means where you say deep calls to deep, um, and then it speaks about under the waterfall. It's in it's in the Psalms. And. It is the deepest things in us calling to the deepest things in God. It is is where fathers will become fathers, where they know the ways of God. Where they've gone beyond just simply wanting to learn uh, the facts. They don't want to just learn the doctrines. They want to know the ways of God, the purposes of God. And the latter, from the deep to the glory, is only going to happen as people go low. They gotta go low. They gotta go low, 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 low. Um, and I want to share a story with you because it's very important. We are the Ark generation. You might have heard your Generation Z or X or No Generation or what, W. I don't know what you were. Double A. Man. They said Double A, and I was like, man, that sounds like a battery. <laughs> Sure, I want to be a double A. You know, I'm not a double A. I think the littlest ones are. I think I don't. Know. I don't even know what they all are. It doesn't matter. We're the art generation. You know what the art? The art generation has to understand something because it speaks about this where David is bringing the ark in. It's really important. Arcs can never, can never be carried by carts. Do you know what carts are? They're boards and big wheels. Some of you will get that. Seeping in. They're brought in through decision makers. It's a cart. And it was evil. 
the reason God struck Uzzah dead, he was angry. His, his, it says his, his fury burned against Uzzah. Because, because Uzzah was caught in the system that was like, we need to help God. God didn't need to be helped. He needed to be obeyed. The Philistines got away with sending the ark with a, on a cart. They had no knowledge. But those who have knowledge need to understand, man, do I, do I have effects on my voice or what? <laughs> you could have said that a long time ago and I would have been okay. Um, there we go. The, the effect on people's lives, people want to help God. This is where the spirit of religion comes. God, I'll help you. God, I'll go to church. Sure, I'll do this for you. Sure, I'll give you a tithe. Sure, it's for you, God. I want to help you. I want to help your church. I want to help. When we believe we can help God, we've missed the whole point. You've never been called to help God. You are helpless before God. He doesn't need your help. He's just looking for your obedience. He's just saying, well, you do what I tell you to do. That's it. And he had told the priests, he told the Levites, he said, listen, that ark has to be carried on some very pure guy's arms. They have to be holy. They had to be absolutely walking with the Lord. They were allowed to carry the ark. It was a privilege. It was an honor to carry the ark. But it was but it was absolutely a call to carry the ark. That they could not put it on a cart to protect themselves from what God might do if they touched it. Do you know why the ark sat there that long in that house? Abinadab's house? You know why? David didn't want anybody else dying. He's like, we got to search this out. we we got to figure out how to do this. And I imagine that in the background, David probably meets with the Levites. And he goes, hey, dudes, this is what Moses said. This is how the ark can be carried. And it can only be carried in such and such a way. And if we do not carry it in that way, we will be offending God. Now, and he probably said, how many of you are walking purely? And they're probably going, I don't know. Well, some of you better get it straight. Because there's a few of you who are going to be carrying this thing. When we go in. And it's a long journey. And remember, as they went in there, he demonstrated again. He demonstrated what it meant. That God was coming. That God had taken ownership. And that he was lordship. I, I am so tired of the, the grace message that has given people so much liberty that they can they feel like they can sin and it's all right. Because what God is doing, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have grace on us. And if we do sin, he does have grace. I'm not saying that. But what it does mean is it means, are you seeking out the Lord? Are you pursuing purity in your life? And and David demonstrates that by taking six steps with the ark being carried six steps just six that wouldn't even be across this room can you imagine this and every six steps they would stop david would sacrifice they do everything he danced this is where he danced where at the end he he was so so undone by god that in every respect he looked completely naked. And what he was demonstrating is exactly what they would do to the enemies of God when they would come back from their battles. They would put the king, the king of that foreign enemy, put them in the front, strip them naked, and make them dance in front of their army as they lead them into the city like we have conquered. David was saying, God, you have conquered me. 
the whole, all of scripture is given. God wants to conquer his people. Jacob, Jacob was a man. His name meant deceiver. He was a man who deceived his brother, stole his brother's birthright, did all these things. He wrestles with God. God wrestles with us. He comes. He says, I'm going, to re- I'm going to break this thing in you. And, and, and the angel wants to leave. It's the angel of the Lord. It's Jesus. It's the praying crying of Jesus who's wrestling with them. So let me go. Daybreak's coming. He says, I will not let you go. I don't care if you hurt me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. There was something he had to have changed in his life. We're going to see a lot of the wrestling of Jacob. We're going to see a lot of the King David dancing, knowing they have been taken over by God. God has taken place, taken taken his rightful place in their life. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Do you know the greatest persecution for believers in all of history? Jesus is Lord. Renounce it. Jesus is Lord. You can go all the way back in the first century, second century, Polycarp. Very gentle, wise old man. Everybody loved him. One day, the kids decided to tease him and they said, Hey, Polycarp, Caesar is Lord. And he said, No, children, Jesus is Lord. Caesar is Caesar. They said, you have to say that. No children. And eventually there was a whole company of people that that heard it and eventually the adults were in it. And they said, you have to say Caesar is Lord. And he said, Jesus is Lord. By the end of the day, they put him up on a stake to burn him and his body wouldn't burn. Literally around him there was like a bubble. That everyone saw. And he wasn't dying. And they were telling him, just say Caesar is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And eventually a soldier came up and stabbed him. And blood gushed out and put out the fire. Killed him. But literally put out the fire. He didn't burn. Jesus is Lord. I want you to know that in your business, in everything you're going to be doing in life, one of the biggest things that's going to have to happen in our lives as believers is Jesus is Lord. Living as Jesus is Lord, letting people know Jesus is Lord. This gospel we believe is not a gospel that's just maintained in churches, in houses. This gospel we believe through obedience we will share it through the world. Oh, I won't go there. I, there's so much more I could say there. He's looking for a resting place in us, guys. Last week, the Lord was speaking to me and he said, you know, Danny, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's not the end. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh. And so what does that mean? He said, Common sense is wisdom. And he says, uncommon sense is wisdom too. And he says, grow in your common sense. Don't allow yourself to be put in traps. Don't allow yourself to be put in situations that are compromising. Don't allow yourself to to be taken. Why? Because many believers are. Fear the Lord. And your wisdom will begin. Fear the Lord. And I promise you that if there's anything that's happened over the past several weeks, it's been the fear of the Lord has been coming. In a big way. And this year will be a year of the fear of the Lord. The holiness of God is about to come visit His church. We're about to see on believers, ready? The seven spirits of God. You say, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I believe in the Trinity. What are you talking about? It's actually in Isaiah chapter 11. The Spirit of the Lord, the first one, is upon him. You know what? Let's do it this way. Just open your life up. Say, Lord, let the Spirit of the Lord come on me. 
Let the spirit of wisdom come on me. Let the spirit of understanding come on me. Let the spirit of counsel come on me. Let the spirit of might come on me. And Lord, let the spirit of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord come on me. Do you know we're not just asking for knowledge? Some people just want knowledge. We want knowledge of the fear of the Lord. That we, we need to have revelation, we need to have understanding, we need to have counsel, we need to have wisdom, we, we need all that. We need a spirit of might. We need his might to come on us. We, we need to function differently as a body. We function in his ways. The Lord showed me, he said, that public preaching, this is separate, ready? Some of you like it, for some of you, it's going to freak you out. It's okay. Public preaching is returning to the streets, to the fields, to the byways. You know what the byways are? They're the malls or shopping centers. They're parks. In front of a Walmart. What? What? Yeah. The Lord reminded me through this. He reminded me when I was in college and it was during the Ugandan revival. And this picture came back. I hadn't thought of it in many, many years. This picture came back and it was a friend of mine. His name was Paul Platz. Paul was a fellow student and he graduated. And when he graduated, he went to Uganda uh, for a season as a missionary. And uh, when he was there, he was in his, in his room uh, downtown. And... Um, all of a sudden, you hear yelling and screaming and just this uproar of the crowd. And immediately he ran. He went to the, it was the square in town where they had taken a man and they had burned him alive. And there was a huge crowd there. He didn't take out his camera to video. He actually got to the highest place he could find to go stand. And he began preaching about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And several thousand, mm -hmm. thousand people came to the Lord that day. Mm -hmm. We are right now on the cusp mm -hmm. of some of the most violent behavior that we've ever witnessed in this nation. I said ever. Yeah. There are things that a lot of people are wondering, is this going to happen? I'm telling you, it is going to happen. Yeah. If you read through um, David Wilkerson's, um, I think it was 1983, he had a vision about New York City. It's like, ah, uh, this is like happening today. <laughs> but it's just beginning. And there are things that we as believers need to understand we carry the answer. We carry the purposes of God for this generation. We are it. We are the message bearers. It's us. And when these things happen, most believers want to remain hidden and afraid, just like they did during COVID. <laughs> want to remain protected, kept away from danger, Danger for believers is actually a shining light. Go. I want to defeat the enemy and you are running from him. The early church only prayed one prayer for themselves. You know what it was? God grant your servants boldness. They recognize, man, this world's an evil, wicked place. We need boldness. We need boldness if we're going to go anywhere and do anything. we got to have the boldness of God. 
And I remembered that story with Paul Platts and the Lord says, Danny, get ready to see this happening in this nation. Get ready to see some of these riot places turning into revivals. Where riots become revivals. Where, where, the, where the move of God obliterates what the enemy is trying to do. Where people who are most hardened against God turn to God. He said, start believing again for what it is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Power. Just the last couple things. Lord, turn me also to um, when he was talking about the fear of the Lord because it's the fear of the Lord that will get you there. Do you understand that? If you fear the Lord, it's like, I'll do anything though. I'll do anything. I fear your name. And um, I, I know when I work with gangs in California, you know, people are like, how do you do that? I said, I'm obeying God. It's the safest place in the world for me to be. That's where he wants me. And there's something about that that we as believers need to understand. Where God wants you is, is safe. Oh, what, what happens if you're martyred? Well, then you're a martyr. But that's where God wanted you. It's okay. You'll be with him. Numbers chapter 16. The rebellion that's begun happening. And you'll see it, this is the tip of the iceberg. It's going to be as it was in number 16, which is the sons of Korah. And there's a rebellion. And I'm telling you, there will be signs and wonders. And the earth is about to open in ways you can't imagine. Last year I talked about the, the geological shifts that were happening last year. And there were many. Many. I spoke about those things. They, there are many huge ones. This year there will be geological openings that are happening in the earth. Things that that'd be like, where did that come from? How deep does it go? And the Lord says, I am. He said, it's a sign. I'm going to swallow up wickedness. I'm going to swallow up darkness in this hour. He said, the enemy thinks he's got us on the run. But he says, we've got the enemy on the run. He knows his days are short, is what Revelation says. Revelation 117, when when Jesus was seen, if you've really seen Jesus, if you've really seen Jesus, if you've really encountered Jesus, when John saw Jesus, he fell down as a dead man. That's a lot of fear. Oh my God, who am I with? And then lastly, uh, there's a lot more, but I won't go. I want to share, actually, if Karen, is Karen in here? Okay, I want her to share something in just one second. I've said almost everything here. Two things. Things are coming at the right time. That's Daniel 9.14. Um, there's going to be a rush to purity, authenticity, responsibility, and bringing character into the realm of grace. Um, and then the Lord reminded me, he said, Danny, never forget the five virgins. There were five wise ones, but there were five foolish ones. The job to get oil is nobody's job but your own. Yes. If you don't have oil, if you're not walking with God, you don't have oil. I'm going to have Karen come in there, Armin, just one second. Could you come up, Mike? Um, I'm going to... There is a... an understanding of the oil of God that God is going to begin giving believers and you're going to begin knowing when you are lubricated when you're full and when your lamp is lit it is lit it must be lit your lamp must be lit it's really important that your lamp is lit you have enough oil to go for the duration of the night a dab won't do you Sitting in on a meeting once in a while 
won't help you. Getting somebody to lay hands on you will not fill your oil. It may release gifts in you. It may give things to you. But it will not give you oil. Oil is for you to get. And the only way we get oil is by us communing with the Holy Spirit. Spending time with Him. Letting Him fill us up. That we realize it's, I don't have to sit in this meeting to be filled. I can be filled by myself with you, Lord. Yes. 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 Karen had a dream, I guess it was three nights ago now. Is that right? About that? And um, I really want her to to share the dream um, because it was so, um, as soon as she shared, I knew this is a word of the Lord. And this is a word for not just future, but now. And uh, it's a very powerful word. And it's not just for us. It's for the body. So, you want to use that mic over there? I guess. (laughs) Didn't know I was going to have to share my dream. (laughs) Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you... um, well, uh, I'm going to keep it really short. I went to jump in the ocean, which is one of my favorite things to do. But when I jumped in to hang out with some people, the water took me out really quick. And it was very, very stormy. And I'm like, well, this is it. Because I knew I was going to drown. <coughs> and as soon as I was like, well, this is it, two people showed up right next to me. And I was like, wow, thanks for being here with me when I'm going to die, you know. <laughs> and um, I knew they I knew they were, I didn't know at the time, but I knew when I woke up they were angels. They were wearing the same clothes, and they were just there with me. And um, the water was just very, very rough, and just a terrible storm. And I, I just remember holding my phone, trying to keep it above the water, so I was going to drown trying to save my phone. <laughs> Anyway, um, so so I saw these two people. They were right there with me, and I was just like, "Wow, you know, thanks for being here." And um, as soon as I said that, though, this this um, brick wall came right down in front of me, just as wide as me not much bigger than me, but tall enough where the water stopped. Um, you know, and it was calm. So then I could, I don't just kind of follow me to the shore where I could get out. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. This is not my time. So. so the two were angels. Right. And um, I felt like it was a word for people who were going to be caught in stormy dangerous situations mm-hmm. in the days to come. Mm-hmm. Do not let fear encompass you. Right. The thing I noticed about that is she's trying to save her phone. Yes. Yeah. Which if she's going to die, the only thing that the phone has is that she she still believes she'd have the ability to communicate. That's right. 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 That it wasn't over. And then the two who came and she says, basically, thanks for coming to tie with me or whatever, to be with me. The Lord... I wouldn't be alone while I was dying. She wouldn't be alone while she was dying. (laughs) The Lord is not going to leave us during those times right now. And there will be things in the coming year that various people are going to find themselves in, wow, I don't know how to get out of this storm. It's going to be different things for different people. Some it might be a financial thing. Some it may be physical. Some it might be family issues. Some it could be uh, relationships. Um, it could be all kinds of things. But when you're in the storm, remember, say, Lord, I, 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 need, I need some angels help me die gracefully here. And I really need that wall. I need to be able to get back to shore. And you know the cool thing about God 
I mean, it is so amazing. At our worst blunders, at our worst failures, He provides a way back to shore. He always does. He always gives us that way back. He's so good. One last thing. I believe it was in the early 1800s. Hudson Taylor um, had a prophecy. And I'm going to read it because there's some things the Lord did speak to me about China and Russia, incidentally, uh, which was unique. I felt like there were some things that were going to happen between China and Russia, not together. I'll just put that there. Let's see that there. But Hudson Taylor's prophecy was quite amazing. And I believe we're about to see this. I saw in this vision a great war that encompasses the world. I saw this war recess and then start again, actually being two wars, World War I, World War II. He didn't know that then. After this, I saw much unrest and revolts that will affect many nations. I saw in some places spiritual awakenings in Russia, in Russia, I saw there will come a general, all-encompassing national spiritual awakening, so great that there could never be another like it. From Russia, I saw the awakening spread to many European countries. Then I saw an all-out awakening followed by the second coming of Christ. That was his vision. What you was that? Oh, just Google Hudson Taylor. I think it's early 1800s. Might have been earlier. Um, there are things that are getting ready to break. And um, some of you have heard me share um, one of Bob Jones' Jones's word from 1980. Why well, it, was, it was actually from yeah 1970 something, but he shared it in in 2004. On you can find it on YouTube mm -hmm. where he's speaking in 1984. And um, and in that word he says very clearly he he literally prophesied everything that's been happening right now. Mm -hmm. He prophesied the Ukraine Russia conflict totally. Um, he said that, um, um, and he also said that there's going to be a massive release that the billion soul youth harvest will begin in Russia. And, um, and that the greatest evangelists the world's ever known are going to come out of Russia. That's why I like the Russians. I'm hanging out with Russians and Ukrainians right now. It's my life. <laughs> Good people. But, um, there's going to be many other things happening. There are things um, I, I, I don't really see uh, the Middle East thing, conflict, just to let you know. People say, what do you think? I don't think it's going to end for a while. And um, as much as there has been an opposition to it, um, I believe that part of that is... Um, is where there's going to be so many that are going to come against um, Israel and Jewish people as we're beginning <coughs> to see already. And it's going to get worse. Not better. Um, but, but the scripture tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we must not neglect what he says. Amen? Amen. I will answer three questions. Oh my gosh, I didn't want to have, really have any. Go ahead, go ahead. Can I share what the Lord showed Oh, you can share, absolutely. I'd like that. <laughs> so I'm going to share first what I saw here tonight. Um, two things I saw. I saw the waterfall. Um, and it wasn't a waterfall. It was just coming down. There were rocks under it, and the water was coming. And then you talked about deep cries out to deep. It flashed before my eyes again. I was like, okay, Lord. The other thing I saw here tonight, and I actually heard the words, I watched the ground open up. It was full of fire, and I heard the sons of Korah. And I was like, ooh, when you said that, I got shivers all up. I was like, oh, my God, that's what I saw tonight. 
And on Friday, um, we were in New York, and the Lord showed me something there. And you talked about the sky is going to open up on the kingdom. Yeah. Well, what I saw on Friday was the sky. And it was a layer, an epidermis layer of skin. And I heard membrane. And then he said, it's the flesh. And he wanted me to remind the body of Christ that that flesh, there are so many circumstances that are going to arise. And if you don't understand that you are a citizen of heaven, like a son or a daughter of the Most High God, and you start thinking in the natural or in a fleshly way, I'm telling you, it's not going to stand. You have got to know who you are, those seven spirits that Danny talked about. You have got to understand that those can be within you. Those are within you because he's in you. And what's coming, that flesh will separate you from the things of the spirit. So you have got to, when it rises up, because I'm telling you it's going to, you have got to remember anything contrary to what God has said, this is the other thing. That's flesh, okay? So know the word. If it's contrary, it's flesh. Let it go. It will separate you from the things of him, and you can't have that in this season. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yeah, Lori. 